but he's in the middle. Checks back against Carter and scores. That is a typical for the Amina Margot. Mark quickly gets it back again. Oh, what a goal! Well, that sums up her season. Hello everyone, this is it, this is it, our final hour, the great battle of our time is here, it's the Conti Cup final preview show, it's Arsenal versus Chelsea, welcome to this edition of the Vic Akers Wonderland podcast, I'm Adam Salter and here to steer us through what's going to be an absolute nerve shredder of a preview is of course my co-conspirators, the magnificent Matt, the lovely Lottie and all the way from DAZN, the resplendent Robert Prattley. Welcome all to the show. Um, Matt, had the nerves kicked in yet? No, I don't think the nerves will kick in until probably the day of the game, travelling up, uh, well, down, shall I say, <laughs> for this game. <laughs> and, and Lottie, um, confident? Or just just sort of wanting to all be over as quick as possible. Um, I'm already restless, so I've not really because I'm not working today. I'm sort of pacing the house. I've been down to the gym twice today, and it's just yeah, it's a lot. I don't like like the build up. The last two days mm. of the like, cup finals, that's really really kicks in for me. Yeah, and it's it's just a nightmare. It doesn't matter if it's men's or women's football; it's the same across the board. It's it, just it's nerve wracking. It's what I've said about like the North London derbies. These cup finals, they're only fun at full time if you've won. Until then, they are not to be enjoyed. They are to be endured. And there was a time in the past for the Arsenal women when get, simply getting to the cup final was tantamount to winning because they already do, always did. Not anymore. Um, and I now pass on to Rob, whose Chelsea team are part of the reason why it's a lot more difficult to win cup finals. Um, how confident are you and the blue side of London? I think it's an interesting one because I, I, I'm one of those people I don't really believe in confidence going into cup finals because I think they're one-off games and yeah. you can be you know phenomenal throughout the season and then come to a cup final and really be poor or alternatively you can really struggle you know in your domestic setting or in European setting you've seen it in Germany with Wolfsburg for example they're in their own cup semi-final tomorrow they've been brilliant in the DFB Pokal they've been awful um, you know domestically and were poor mm. in the Champions League so I, I think it's you know it's a one-off game anything can happen. I'm just really, what I really want is a good game. I, I tend to not get the nerves until the morning of. It tends to be, again, the travelling up sort of to a <laughs> cup final because there's such a few, such a, you know, finite number of them um, in the football calendar, both mm. for the men and women. Like, it becomes, it does become an occasion. Well, there have been many of these occasions down the years and that's where our icebreaker will begin and it's quite a simple one, but it's a double question and that is, what has been your favourite Arsenal versus Chelsea Cup final memory and what has been your worst and Rob as the guest of the show I'm giving you first dibs what's been your favourite cup final and what's been your your worst FA and Conti you can have both FA and Conti Cups yeah I'll I'll go for in I'll go for one of each Uh, the FA Cup final the uh, the final lovingly Christopher Chelsea as the Ramona Backman final Um, after several years of Backman (laughs) to of Backman uh, flattering to deceive and, you know, a lot of, a lot being said about her and a lot mm. being said about the quality of the player. You saw what she can do in a big game. Um, and also Fran Kirby, I think, scoring that game is, you know, that moment, that was the one, it was a record crowd at the time, mm. sort of for, I think it was around 45,000. And it was actually, I remember it being on, I was there that day, but I was also, you know, being on the BBC One, actually getting the proper dues and me starting to think, actually, you know what, women was starting to get the acknowledgement, the recognition it deserves more and more. Um, and you know the fact that we won it also, you know, never a bad thing. Uh, and then was, was again that, on the other the, side of it, I was going to say was that the three one when Miedemar got like a late consolation and then yeah, Chelsea me, me, about, me, my, yeah, well Miedemar scored and then about two minutes later Frank Kirby <laughs> went straight up the other end. You know, as you like seeing cup finals, I, I could have gone for the obvious one. Of, well, you know, well, that's I, I won't have it. the obvious. <laughs> one, but, but in terms of the in terms of worst one, I think for me, like last year was really bad for a number of reasons. Mm. Um, so my current partner actually with, I 
uh, it was our second date. <laughs> uh, she was unwell. She came to the cup final with me. I was awful nervous. It obviously started really well, ended really badly. We had horrible travel getting back, and then we were both sick for a week. <laughs> but we're still together. So, That's good. You know, obviously, something... I have, however, banned her from any other Chelsea women's <laughs> Well, Because, you know, I've concluded that I can't allow that bad omen, you know, I can't allow these bad omens to happen. No, uh, that's fair no, enough. That's, that's you're an Arsenal fan, then. No, no, she actually, she herself isn't actually much of a sort of football fan, but she agreed to come along because she knew it was important to me. Um, oh, that's is, awesome. Yeah, really nice. That is awesome. That is awesome. So fair, fair play to her. Um, and hopefully glad you know, you're know you both together and both well than, uh, than last time. Lottie, um, I think Rob did hint of the obvious one. Are, are you going to play the obvious card? <laughs> I am going to play the obvious card because that game is giving me tra- trauma. Jen beat my first cup final watching the girls and I saw Lotta and Jen beat at Wembley like that. No, thank you. <laughs> that that's probably the worst one. I think the, one of the best ones was probably last year down at Crystal Palace for me. Yeah. Um, in terms of women's cup finals, because I haven't been to loads, and it's just those two are the main two for me. No, yeah. that was like for me that was like the not not as big as the Euros, but it was that same sort of thing. It's yeah, same it was, energy, it's same energy and that, yeah. it felt so good. Um, yeah. Matt, do you have uh, any different? I mean, I've got a few in my mind. I want to see if they're going to be the same as what you're going to go for. Well, there hasn't really been uh, any really other cup finals that I've been to where it's not been a bad experience bar the one Lottie's talked about. Um, uh, yeah, this was, a th- this was the 3-0 uh, 2021 when um, yeah. Sam Kerr it was, it was COVID, and Frank... It? It, was, it, was just, it was just after COVID. We got absolutely battered and Sam Kerr pulled out an outrageous chip to kill the game. But to be honest, as... I was watching it at five minutes in and I was like, yeah, we're not winning this. <laughs> you could just tell five minutes in when saying Kirby scored and Zins, when we was at the end of Kirby scored. And I was thinking, yeah, we, we, we're at, we're not winning this. We might as well just go home. But we stood, we stood by them until full time and it was an awful cut final to watch. But yeah, it was just one of those moments. And a bit like, we'll talk about the game what's happened on, mm. on Friday. Um, double Friday, that was another one you watched and you go, yeah, we're not going to win it. But sorry, Matt, you're saying um, good and bad. Uh... Well, yeah, this is the thing. I mean, I've been to the, the playoff final in the national uh, women's national league um really good experience up at stockport the um the uh, uh, yeah by the fa cup i think the only bad experience i've had of a of a league cup or, or of an fa cup is um all men's games so the, the um, one that right. goes to mind is actually the odd one where southampton lost to man united a couple of couple well, you, years were a South, ago. you were southampton at the yeah time, i was down you? in southampton mm. so managed to get myself a ticket it was, it was a great day but just uh yeah it wasn't meant to be for the day but last minute winner wasn't it yeah, yeah. um oh. there's always some good cup finals whenever it comes to women's football i mean look at the other week you had um oh who was it? hashtag United versus yeah. Newcastle? That was a really good one. I was a hashtag. bit surprised that it was in in Luton, to be honest, because they they should have been somewhere bigger. Let's be honest. <laughs> but but hashtag one nonetheless, which was a bit I think a bit of a surprise. I think we all thought Newcastle might have done it. For me, I've got two gone for two finals that none of you have picked, which I'm quite happy with. And I'll go with the worst one, and that is the Conti Cup final in 2020. And this stings for quite a few reasons. Uh, one, A, because we lost. Uh, B, because it was Beth England with the 90-second minute win. Similar to how with the whole Frank Kirby, medium, I think. Um, Leah Winston gets a late. Arsenal, well, we should make a case. Arsenal battered Chelsea for the entire final. But catch, Anne Katchenberger had one of those games of her life, which we saw also in the Champions League in the following season. Williamson bundles in a late equaliser. I think, great, let's get it to extra time. And literally the last kick of the game, Chelsea mug Arsenal account and Beth England taps in. And what made it even worse was not the fact that we lost and it was a trophy we, we weren't going to get, but the world ended immediately afterwards. We went into lockdown. And we had, I, as an Arsenal fan, that was the last game. And that was just, I, that just stuck in my mind until the season kicked off again. And so, what was it? four months, five months, however long it was. And that was just the last result we had. It was just a really, really painful result and also sort of triggered the end of sort of the, well, the, the beginning of the end of Joe Montemurra, really. It was sort of, couldn't, Emma Hayes went one way and Joe Montemurra, we sort of went south after that, which is a bit sad. One of the favourite ones and iconic ones is the 2016 FA Cup final. I believe it's the first time Arsenal played off against Emma Hayes' Chelsea in a cup final. Arsenal won Dan Carter's goal. But for me, it meant a bit more because it meant that both Kelly Smith and Alex Scott got the chance to lift a trophy at Wembley. And for me, two iconic lionesses 
Arsenal players to have the opportunity to go up those steps and lift the FA Cup is something special. And it was a very special goal from Dan Carter to uh, to win it. Haven't won the FA Cup since, <laughs> but that for me is is a particularly uh, memorable moment. So we will go into some news, but I just want to chat with Rob quickly because obviously this is an Arsenal podcast, but you have decided to support the blue half of Matt, of, uh, of London. <laughs> How did that happen? What 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 drew you to the blues uh, rather than the glorious red of North London? <laughs> so, so, I mean, I'll, there's a, it's a very, very long story, but I'll like boil down to the key. The key element that really cemented it towards the end was uh, Gianfranco Zola scoring a back heel against oh, Norwich in an FA yes. Cup game, which yeah. happened to be televised. Um, and it was one of the first times I watched televised football. Fair enough. I remember seeing it and thinking... Oh, well, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> from a Chelsea women's point of view, it actually yeah. came when, again, when I was at university, um, it was expensive, more expensive to go and see the members. I could go down to Wheatsheaf Park and um, a lot of the wow. time, it was, a, it was a couple of quid to get in. Or alternatively, if, you know, you timed it right, you didn't really even pay because of how <laughs> poor the stewarding was. Um, and that, that's not being critical. That's just na- the nature mm. of, you know, where, we, where we've come from. I think it's important to remember that. But yeah, like, again, when people sort of talk about and this is what does annoy me when people talk about, for example, the Conti Cup and they sort of devalue it at times. I sort of say, I remember the days when, you know, I was sort of looking at Chesswood and we were losing to London Bees in the Conti Cup group stages. Well, that's funny like you mentioned that. that one because that's the one that actually a certain Alessia Russo uh, played in uh, many, mm. many moons ago. That was her only game for, for, uh, for Chelsea and yes. it was pe- penalties, wasn't it, in the end? Yes. And th- that's exactly it. Like, you know, as a result, you don't, I don't take any game in any competition sort of for granted. And I think... It's a terrible attitude, you know, as a fan, but especially as a player, when you start looking at games and thinking, yeah, we just need to turn up to win. That's exactly when you start losing those sort of games and having, you know, that sort of mentality and arrogance creep in. And now you're a journalist who reports on Chelsea. You've you've, you've sort of gone from fan to, to, to journalist in the media sense, media box. Yes, although I do have a bit of a rule that I still don't cover Chelsea games because I did it once. And I just couldn't keep my, I just couldn't keep myself in check. I did the um, Manchester City game a few years ago, uh, Kings Meadow, where we won one nil. Guru Wright and scored in a game where all I remember Which... of it just being assisted by the wind. Um, <laughs> afterwards, I got like you know the amount of bad, like, dirty stares I got because of the amount of noise I was making <laughs> as we were playing blocks and the second. I was like, right, okay, that ruins it. But as a result, it means I really enjoy when I go and do press experiences of other teams. Yeah. Because I go like pretty much, I, I tend to avoid the real top clashes when I have like swing in the stake of it. But I really enjoy it when I get to go and watch, you know, some of the mid table sort of WSL teams or go and see some of the other European teams or mm. teams in the W Championship. Because I can just enjoy it and be like, actually, you know, I just really want to see a great game of football to write about. Yeah, I, I can sympathise with that because I did a media experience for the Arsenal Watford FA Cup game, and I knew I was like, I'm going to struggle not to like keep myself in check either because I can't show any bias towards, even though I'm in the home sort of press box and I'm amongst other journalists who are clearly Arsenal fans, I've got to somehow suppress my inner Arsenal, and um, it, it's not easy. <laughs> but I totally get it. Going to a game where you've got no emotional um, stakes and you can just enjoy the game for what it is, it's a fantastic experience and one I really probably should try and do a bit more. Well, great to have you on, and there's lots of news to talk about. Um, quite a bit of Arsenal, but also as the game of the whole. Firstly, Leah Valti is now is now confirmed injured. The pictures have come out, her knees in a brace. Um, it is strongly believed that this is an MCL, and if that is the case, she's out for the season, which is gutting. Um, but I will just go to you with this one, Rob. Seeing Leah Valti out, knowing what a key player she is, do you I don't. Nobody wishes injuries on people, but is that a player that you would have been worried about facing had she been fit for the cup final? Oh, I mean, if people like anyone who just know my Twitter or knows anything about me knows that I frequently have said on multiple Arsenal podcasts I would rather face an Arsenal side that has every player fit, Barley or Walty, than place <laughs> you know where you've got Mead and Meyer and Mead out, but you've got Leah Walty in there. She is a phenomenal footballer, an incredible human being, a fantastic leader. I think the best way I can sort of sum her up is she, in many ways, she's your version of what Erin Cuthbert is to us in that you don't necessarily yeah. notice her when she's playing, but when she's absent, you notice that massive great hole mm. in the middle of the part. And again, I hate seeing teams, you know, I don't like teams when they play each other and they don't have their top sides. I want yeah. to, you know, as a chess fan, I want to see us beat Arsenal when they've got their best team out there because it feels more genuine if mm. you've got that. So yeah, I'm genuinely quite devastated. Because Walty is one of those players I just really, really like. She she is one of the majestic 
midfielders very much one generation two footed you know left and right footed equally and can ping a pass and occasionally score a weldy if you're lucky to be there um other news there has been a departure but it's one i think we all saw coming which was sarah buhadi she has said her goodbye she's no longer at arsenal it was a bit of a, an odd deal but necessary to cover obviously for sabrina's trip to the um was it the, the gold cup was it called in the end the in america so yep sarah's gone so we're back to having sabs uh naomi williams and Manu to pick from in goal. Um, ex schooner Anna Patton, she has switched allegiances. She has joined up with the Republic of Ireland. Um, Matt, you were sort of singing uh, Anna Patton's praises um, in our Villa pod. Mm-hmm. Bit of a surprise for this one. Um, England have lost a, a gem here, haven't they? I really do think that. I'm, If I'm honest, I would see further down the line, Lotto Evenoy and Anna Patton as potentially the Millie Bright, Leah Williamson um, partnership that England have at the moment or don't have because of injuries has sort of cur- uh, cur- uh, curtailed that at the moment. Um, it, it is a shame, but at the same time, she, it's, it's more minutes. I mean, Lucy Qu- uh, Louise Quinn can't play centre back forever. I think she's yeah. coming towards the end of her career now. She's still at Bonham. Um, but it, it's an opportunity to see her shine and almost say to Serena, this is what could have happened if you'd allowed me to come in. Because mm. she's been kicking around in these sort of under 21s for quite a few Under 23s, um, yes. 23s, so yeah. I, was, I was there when uh, at Printing Park for the game against, uh, I think it was Belgium, where mm. where we won, uh, where England won 3 1. And she put on a really good display alongside people like Ruby Mace, who might not mm. even get an opportunity herself. There's plenty of players in that under 23 side that you look at even now or in the next couple of years that if they're not pushing on they might look to go to follow Anna's step and go and play for Scotland Wales or Northern Ireland well we wish obviously Anna Pat all the best gutted that she's not going to be going for the uh wearing the white of uh of the lionesses um speaking of lionesses um a few uh bit of news firstly the Lioness captain and Arsenal defender Leah Williamson. It is her birthday. So a massive happy birthday to Leah Williamson, 27 years old. Um, absolutely thrilled that we are lucky enough to have her in our in our ranks. Um, just a quick uh, pass round for the group. Favourite Leah Williamson moment, Arsenal or England? Um, Lottie, I'll come to you first. It's got to be the half Ayeli and um, with Leah Williamson uh, interviews for the final Lisma. Just all, oh, yes. all, the, all the content that came out of that. And then... I'm just going to add into the end of that. I think Leah Williamson ended end of last season off her crutches in a half early shirt. Mm. I mean, it's moments like that when she's coming over and they're coming and interacting with the fans and things. We hadn't seen much of her due to her ACL, but it was it's just little things like that. They just Matt, mean everything. Matt, any any particular Leah moments that come to mind? Yeah, I've, I've, there's so many I could I mentioned, um, but the one that sticks to mind is Kate McKay put a cross in, I can't remember who the team was, and then Woody, Leah heads it home, but she looks like a, she sort of stumbles afterwards because she, Kate put so much Hoffenheim, power Hoffenheim, yeah, she, it was, yeah. A, it was a wicked she corner. Concussion, she had concussion, <laughs> didn't she? Because yeah. I remember that one. Mm, that was the 4-0 one, that was a, that was a good one. Um, Rob, obviously you are not in the Leah domestic camp, but you are obviously in the international camp, so... Is there anything of her time at England that that um, as captain or otherwise that, that springs to mind? Yeah, well, there's two actually. Well, the obvious one is the fact that you know she is the only captain this century for any English national side to lift a trophy, which is <laughs> automatically is a good thing. But I'm actually going to say the the one that really stood out for me as a captain, I think it demonstrated her leadership qualities, is the game against Australia that we lost two um, 0 at Brentford. Mm. And she came out immediately afterwards and took full responsibility for it. It was her mistake, yeah. and, you know, it was a poor mistake. But to do that as a captain and come out and be that stark and that honest afterwards and, you know, be that sort of brutal about yourself, it shows, I think, what a character and a leader sort mm. of she is. And I, th- there are very few players that would come out and do that, knowing how the English media are. And, uh, yeah, that was something I was, like, genuinely, that was very, very impressive. For me, there was a few I was going to pick to. One of them was the 2019 World Cup, and she gets to come on for about five minutes against um, Cameroon. 
um, and that in the um, it was last sixteen game, and it was like we didn't that even know then game. it was a mad <laughs> game for other reasons, but we didn't know then that that was the future the captain. The next tournament she was going to be in was lifting the the Euros. So I have to look at the Euros, and I have to look at her match interview, post match interview with her, and she's screaming herself hoarse and trying to describe the emotion of having lifted the Euros at Wembley in front of a full crowd, and trying to encourage people to come to games in the WSL. And that was sort of the key bit. You know, it was all well and good you coming up to support England, but please come to, you know, likes of Meadow Park, King's Meadow, um, the the Joy Stadium, and 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 support your local team, your your team. And um it's fair to say it's worked. <laughs> we are seeing it now. So um yeah, a lot of love for Leah Williamson and hope we see you in the uh, in the Conti Cup final and um I think I can echo sentiments of, of at least two of my guests. I hope she has an amazing game. But <laughs> speaking of Lionesses, there has also been an ex Lioness that has retired, and that is, of course, Steph Horton. Um, the word legend barely scratched the surface of who she was as a player for Arsenal, for Man City, um, Leeds, Sunderland, and, of course, England. Um, Rob, what is Steph Horton's legacy? And is there a particular memory or, or moment that you'll always associate with her? I'll always associate the fact that whenever she seemed to play Chelsea, she always seemed to have a brilliant game, which is really annoying. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, as I sort of said, I, I tweeted about it the other day, you know, people talk about the current generation of Lionesses, you know, inspiring a nation. And I think that's very, very important to say. But they don't get there without the likes of, you know, Jill Scott, Alex yeah. Scott, Karen Carney, um, Eni Aluko, Steph Horton, being there and pushing for that drive and pushing for that change and, you know, pushing for those standards to improve. Um, I think it's telling with Steph Horton that she, you know, she had she sort of did it as quite a quiet announcement. There were no, you know, bells, fanfares, sort of whistles. It was, you know, there, there was opportunity, for example, if they wanted to, to do it at the Etihad the weekend bederhand um, mm. after, you know, they'd just beaten the United in the derby. But I think she chose to do it in this way because it matches her character. Quiet leadership, understated leadership, and, you know, ultimately someone who I think everyone in the game respects. And I think Emma Hayes said it, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to see her going to coaching. I think she would make a phenomenal coach. I, I mean, I think she'll excel wherever she goes next. I could see her doing you know, the punditry like, you know, um, Izzy Christensen and, and Kaz Carney. She definitely has the knowledge and um, the experience. Um, Lottie, um, I, I mean, you, you've only come to us a bit recently. I don't know how much Steph Horton you, you've been able to enjoy um, Not since you come along. Not very much. It's more a case of highlights against Chelsea. So that mm. kind of put a smile on my face. Sorry, <laughs> Rob. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't. I didn't get the opportunity to really watch Steph play properly, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Matt, was there any any Horton, Horton thoughts, memories? Uh, there's so many going into the uh, the 2015 World Cup. That was when mm. I started watching women's football for, um, internationally before I slowly got into the club football. Uh, I I think it's a bit of an odd one. I think she, uh, more, more of what's because of her minutes that's happened this season, she's not getting that many compared to say when she was in the England team that just and she's sort of been removed from that without out much um but well there was some fuss shall we say um I I was just wondering maybe she would be willing to go to back to Sunderland and do a season there before she retired but no she's decided that she's going to uh, move on um if I had to say a favorite one there was a free I think a I know you talked about the Cameroon game, but I think there was a free kick yeah. in. Um, it was against Cameroon, the indirect one. Yeah, in it was, yeah. It was such a bizarre game, as we mentioned, as mm. I said earlier, such a bizarre game for so many reasons. But Steph Horton and free kicks, a centre back taking them. You didn't really hit, think of anything like that. Yeah. Think of football in general. So a centre back taking free kicks and blasting them into the top corner is pretty unheard of. So I think that will always stick to me. But I think everyone's got their own. Um, Oh, I've, got, I've got yeah, I've got so many. So I mean, many. I, I I could reel them off. I mean, free mm-hmm. kicks. I always remember that one she scored against Arsenal in the FA Cup was an absolute pearl. And she she was probably one of the best goal scoring defenders. Cause I think she started as a forward and sort of moved backwards from you know, to midfield of in defence. But I remember the first time I encountered Steph Horton was the Olympics. I was actually she actually scored against New Zealand in one of my first ever games I went to as uh, you know, on my own. Um, it was a Team GB against uh, Cam- I think it was also I think it was also Cameroon, and she had an amazing Olympics. Scored against New Zealand, scored that goal at Wembley against Brazil, and that sort of put her into the into the spotlight and some great memories of Arsenal. And then I remember 2015, how she dragged England, we were losing against Norway, dragged England off the canvas as the captain and got us 
eventually to third place and then I just think her career just sort of went on almost this, on this awful sort of tragic twist with 2019 that penalty that she missed against the USA and and sort of then I think of the Olympics and didn't have a great Olympics and I just remember that last the last image of her sort of playing international football was watching her get bodied by Sam Kerr in extra time for that fourth goal that knocked us out and then missing out on on the Euros. And I just think it was one play. I can understand that the reasons why she shouldn't you know, didn't go to um, Euro 2022, and I think ultimately was the right call. But it's it's kind of sad that the player who had given so much for England just missed out of the the, the season that the the tournament that we actually do it. And you know she deserved. She got the bronze medal at Canada, and that'll always be a key moment for England. But yeah, she just sadly missed out by one tournament at the moment when football did come home. Um, but a legend of the game, won, you know, WSLs, FA Cups, League Cups, Gonti Cups, whatever you call them. And yeah, wish her all the best going forward. Um, we will now swerve violently into Chelsea territory because it, <laughs> it may have escaped our attention. Chelsea have made the Champions League semi finals. Um, so, Rob, um, this has been the one competition. I think Emma Hayes has wanted above all others at Chelsea. Now she's won the lot, but this is the one that's constantly slipped through her fingers. Um, so in your mind, how has this campaign gone for Chelsea? And do you fancy your chances against Barcelona? It's been a bit of a weird sort of, I suppose, Champions League campaign, because I think at this moment in time, like there've been a lot of games where Chelsea have played I'd sort of use the phrase they've played okay and they've done enough um to mm. sort of win games, but they haven't necessarily hit I think absolute top gear, but when they found top gear in games, either in moments or in spells, they've looked quite mesmerizing. Uh, I think that certainly, I, I think there's no reason to not. I don't have the, quite the fear of Barcelona that I had a couple of years ago after that, you know, the Champions League final, because that little game was a drubbing. You know, that's one of the most painful experiences I've ever had, especially due to the fact it was in an empty stadium. I think I wasn't, you know, wasn't going to bring it up. I wasn't going to bring no, it no, up. I, I, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think it's important to acknowledge it because I always say, you know, I, I always say to people, like, you can't ultimately that's going to fuel the players in there. And I've got no doubt that fueled them last year. Obviously last year it was a 2-1 loss on aggregate. And the fact that we lost to an absolute wonder goal from Caroline Graham Hansen, yeah. I've got no problem if we lose to the best teams in the world because they do something spectacular against us. Ultimately it's the Champions League for a reason. And to win the Champions League, you need to be an incredibly special team that are capable of incredibly special moments. Mm. And that is exactly, you know, I think that is what Barcelona I think are. Um, what I really, really want, and I sort of said this, I think Chelsea had the benefit this time around because the second leg is at home. What I think they yes. might try and do, and I sort of said this sometimes, I think they will try and go away to Barcelona with a similar mentality that they had last year of yeah. go away, make it really difficult, make it hard for them, and bring it back to Stamford Bridge, knowing that certain players at Stamford Bridge this season have just found another peak and another level, and especially well, in... We'll, we'll come to that in a bit. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, I think all four of the teams that are left, uh, you know, maybe with the exception of Paris Saint-Germain, all f- you know, certainly three of the four of them, you'd look at them on paper and say, yeah, you expect them to be in the semi-finals. Mm. PSG themselves are still a very, very good team. That's not to, you know, undermine them. So I, I think you're getting to a point now where any of the teams left can win it, I think, in all honesty, and the, may the best team win. I... I mean, I'm the opinion of whoever wins between Chelsea and Barcelona will win the Champions League. That, that's, the, that's the side of the draw I think the winner will come from. I just think Leon, Chelsea beat Leon last season. We beat Leon last season as well. But um, Chelsea managed to get one over Leon then, obviously on penalties. So they know that they, they, know they can take them. Um, I, th- I think it's going to be, yeah, that's, I think it's going to be Chelsea or Barcelona. One of those two will win it. So, yeah, I say may the best team win. Um, I do want to just double down a bit more on this because uh, on the Chelsea side, this is Emma Hayes' last season. Um, and as much as I know as Arsenal fans, um, it, it, she, she, has, she has made Chelsea, obviously, the giant. She's, she's just deposed Arsenal from the top of the... the, the, the there's no way of sugarcoating it. It's, it's pure fact. She's the best manager of the WSL era. But this is the one trophy so that's a stick for her fingers. Will it tarnish at all her legacy How if she doesn't claim this one trophy? I'm going to go out and be absolutely honest and say no. Like, I think if you look at where Chelsea were when Emma Hayes came in and where Mm. she's leaving the club, albeit, you know, with the investment and that has to be acknowledged in there, it's a completely different behemoth. We know we've gone from a team that, you know, were mid table in the league and occasionally could, you know, have the odd cup run to a quarter final to being a team nowadays that, you know, if we're not getting to a couple of finals in a year, 
I'm disappointed if we're not, you know, lifting the trophy at the end of the season. I'm disappointed. And I think uh, ultimately I'd love her to win it. You know, I, I think a lot of people would, you know, wouldn't begrudge her and say that it's the sort of fairy tale ending she does deserve. But ultimately, football doesn't do fairy tales. You know, we've learned, we've well seen that. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm well aware of that. And you know, I'm well aware of it. And I think if she gets it, it'll crown it to, you know, be an incredible legacy and it will just make it, you know, that bit more special. But I think mm. even if she doesn't, you're still talking about the manager who I think, you know, you're looking at the female equivalent of, say, an Alex Ferguson or an Arsene yes. Wenger that has been so transformative, not just to the club, but I think to the league as a whole. I've always compared her to Alex Ferguson in the way that just the, her sheer force of personality and, and, and win to, you know, the, the, winning is above all is everything. And if you're not on that train, then you're out of the club and I'll get some better in who will win and just drives at home. And over the years and years she's been there, it's just become the mantra at Chelsea. And you see that in some of these games. And I, th- I think back to that one season, we finished a point behind Chelsea and they had that win at home to Aston Villa. And the last, the dying embers of that game and, and Sam Kerr pops on long ball and scores. And you just think that is Emma Hayes' Chelsea, that you could you can have them in your pocket for 90 minutes, 95 minutes, but they'll find a way. They always find a way. And that, that is down to her, in my opinion. Um, before we move on, just a quick favourite Emma Hayes memory that you have as a Chelsea fan? Oh, that, that one, to be honest, that game is up there. Um, that, that game is absolutely up there. On that day, I actually broke a seat at Kings Meadow um, <laughs> because... Uh, like it was such a ridiculous game, and like uh, uh, Hannah Hampton, ironically, had mm. the game of her life against us. And um, now I don't like screaming expletives at goalkeepers, but the amount of expletives that you know, I, I let's just say I felt that Hannah having a very good game was not very good for my blood pressure that day. <laughs> um, and yeah, I remember just being it was bonkers, and that is one of the like I always think of moments where you think titles are won for me, it's that one, and then last yeah. year, the Liverpool game at home where Sam Kerr bundled in um you know again bundling in sort of a goal late on in that one after we'd come from one nil down that was the moment again i was like yep yeah, you know this title race is done this title race is won and i just think yeah there's there's too many emma memories to sort of count at some point at the end of the season it will like hit me properly i'm still mm. somewhat in denial that she's going and at some point it'll just like hit me and i'll just you know start sobbing uncontrollably somewhere well, obviously, she's going to the US and um, as as, uh, as supporters of women's football as a whole, we wish her all the best um, and you know, we'll see how her successor, whoever that may be, can carry on her legacy. But it's a pretty, uh, it's a it's a tough, tough gig to fill that one. Um, big, big, big boots to fill. We'll move it now back to safer ground, which is Arsenal. And that is that Laura Wienreuter has played her first football minutes uh, since her ACL injury. She was with the, um, I believe it's the under-21s. Um, Lottie, how excited are you to see her at some point, hopefully this season, play minutes again for the first team? But she's um, on the bench against Villa. Yeah, she was on the bench against Villa. I want her to stay on the bench against Chelsea. <laughs> at, this point, at this point, I just want to wrap her up in cotton wool. Um, obviously, it's, it's a case, again, of building all those minutes up and bringing her back to the team for her to sort of compete with Emily Fox for that spot. But Emily Fox, is just it's she's just slotted into that right-back position like a like a perfect size shaped mm. puzzle piece. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that rotates out next season when she's back up and fully running with the first team. Um, but yeah, really excited she's back. It's just nice to have our smiley Laura back. Absolutely. A tiny tank, as we, we like to call her. I mean, her, her ACL, she was the fourth ACL we had that season. And all the other three were such painful moments and I was there for two of them the the previous two out of the previous three and the fourth one happened just after we'd equalized against Wolfsburg and I hate to say it because we'd had so many ACLs I was just numb to it it just sort of became a it's another ACL and it's just it just it was ridiculous um that she suffered that as well but we've seen the pictures online the way that and the the documentary the way that Beth and and Viv have looked after her and helped her get through it and um they were there to support her she she came off after a few minutes I don't think she's fully fit yet but these are critical minutes for her and I can't wait to see her play again um I think she offers that that dynamism and pace um she came back a different player after the Euros you know just took the right back slot out of Noel and Rich's hand and she never got it back so um here's hoping we see her I reckon we'll see her next month so here's hoping we'll see her play soon um we will now of course though we've put it off long enough the preview the Conti Cup final um and I think we as we'll start with Chelsea I think that's probably the best place to start we'll start with Chelsea um 
Rob, you probably know better than me. Um, as far as I can see, there's no Sam Kerr, obviously, because she's now had an ACL. And again, wish her all the best. I don't believe Millie Bright is ready yet. Um, though Ramirez was back in the, um, at the midweek and scoring the Champions League. Who else is or is not available that we know of, at least? Yeah, so uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Mara Mielda, I believe, is still unfit. She was in basic training, but I don't think she's ready to start, certainly. Natalie Bjorn is obviously cup tied, and, you know, it would be awful if a team played a cup tied player this year. <laughs> cup, it? It'd be dreadful. We had um, a lot of laughs with that. I must admit, we had a lot of laughs with that. When, when I got out the, game, out the game at Reading, we won 6 0, and I was getting my phones up, and I was hearing that Maritz had been subbed on. I was like, and then it turned out that meant that Man United were getting kicked out of the Conti Cup because of it. Uh, it was very, very funny. Um, yeah. So, um, yes. Another Pure content. <laughs> another one of those Woso heritage moments. We also Absolutely. Love. But uh, yeah, so B- Bjorn is out. Uh, me official and Sam Kerr, obviously, as we know, uh, long term absentees of ACLs. Yeah. Um, there are, yeah, Myra Ramirez is coming back from her injury, but again, based on against Ajax at the weekend, that, you know, there isn't much of an injury there, in yeah. all honesty. Uh, other than that, I think um, Georgia Fox is now back in training, but I'd be very, very, very surprised. <laughs> If she features at the weekend. Uh, other than that, Millie Bright, yeah, is the other medium-term absentee. We're hoping to see her after the international break. Um, I did want to. I mentioned her earlier. I don't know if there's anything we can dab on at all, but uh, Anne Katchenberger, I don't believe has played since the Emirates game. Um, is she injured? Is she? Are we not going to see her at all? Or so. So, to my knowledge, there's a couple of things that have happened here. Firstly, she was injured. Um, right after Christmas, she picked an ankle injury. Mm. Secondly, there's been Hannah Hampton's form. Mm. I, I've known, I've seen the articles this week about that uh, the German journalist talking to the uh, new manager. Again, I'm not going to openly discredit him, because no, ultimately no. he's had this conversation. But from when Emma did say about them, you know, training with the young sort of academy lads in the woods, I know that does happen. Mm. I know for a fact one of the academy lads at one point had the fun of, uh, defenders had the fun of training against Myra Ramirez, and he actually <laughs> hated it for about half an hour. <laughs> Um, because uh, yeah, had Myra Ramirez just backing into him for half an hour, which is not particularly fun, I can imagine. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think ultimately it's one of those situations where Chelsea have got three goalkeepers at the club in yeah. you know, Hampton, Musovic and Berger, even you know, Everard, who was out on loan. Who, you know, between those four, realistically, they all have plots to play for their country. Some of them even start for their country. Um, it's just such a strong department. Similar to, you know, at Arsenal, with Arsenal's situation where you've mm. got Ginsberger and you've got um, uh, D'Angelo. And yeah. I, I was trying to remember the other day, you've got a young goalkeeper who's... Naomi very, Williams. Yeah, there, there we go. That was the name I was trying to work out the other day. And I was like, there's so much strength in the goalkeeping mm. departments at WSL site. And you look at City, for example, where they've got, you know, Robot can't even get anywhere near no. the sort of squad. There's so much strength in, in WSL goalkeeping departments. So I don't think there's necessarily too much to... You know, read into that. But ultimately, I also know that Emma is one of those people that, you know, whatever she says in the press conference, don't take it at face value. Like, uh, uh, Emma, you know, rule one, Emma lies. Well, we learned that before the Stanford Bridge game when we heard that, oh, Lauren James was ill and, and it might be a I doubt for this. Yeah, I, I know. You. And Lottie was like, no. Uh, I, can say, I can say for a fact uh, on this, because I know someone that knows Lauren James very, very well, Lauren had actually been ill in the run-up to that game. And well, she did she... Actually play, like, she did actually play, you know, not at full fitness. Well, she didn't look like she was ill on the night because, and then again, that's a player we'll get in, into a minute. In a minute, um, yeah, the, the goalkeepers I find is very interesting. I remember last season we had Musovic we, again in the Emirates game, and she was amazing, kept Chelsea in it, and then obviously Kerr got an equaliser. Berger then came in for the cup final. I think she was found um, wanting, obviously, on the the own goal, and I think she didn't have a great game at the Emirates as well. Um, I think that we'll get onto team predictions in a minute, but I don't think we're going to see Berger in, in this cup final. And it's a shame, really. I remember she was a great keeper. I'm wondering if maybe we're, we're seeing the end of her career at Chelsea, but that remains to be seen. What um, I am curious, yes? Just on keepers, I'm just wondering, Rob, why isn't Musevich getting the minutes? I mean, Hannah hmm. Hunt has just come in and we still, we're still not seeing Musevich at all. And she was brilliant at the World Cup. I think mm. you saw exactly why Musovic isn't getting the minutes midweek against Ajax. In that yes. You had, you had a game that ca- encapsulated Sakina Musovic perfectly. Uh, you know, started off really, really shaky, made some terrible mistakes, was found awful for the goal, and then produced three absolutely wonderful saves. The consistency just isn't there as a goalkeeper. Right. And I think you saw that at the World Cup. She had a couple of games where she looked really shaky and then produced that performance against the USA. Um, <laughs> and I think Hampton... Hampton has come in, she's just shown so much dominance and control, but also her passing ability. I mm. think that's the biggest thing that you notice with um, 
Hampton, and especially the ability to sort of pass into the midfield. And nowadays it's becoming, as much as I personally am a bit of a footballing purist, and the goalkeeper is there to defend the goal, and <laughs> I don't really care if they can pass or not. But the modern football dictates that your goalkeeper needs to be able to ping it, you know, 40 yards into the striker's feet. And so rightly or wrongly, I think, you know, some very, very good shot stoppers and players that are good shot stoppers in the WSL get overlooked for goalkeepers that are better with their feet. And obviously you've then got people like Keating, who is coming through as the best of both worlds. Like Keating mm. is, you know, very, very good shot stopper, but also can pass it, you know, similar to Yui Hasegawa. I do, just before we have goalkeepers, I want to say on the Hampton subject, because I remember when we all sort of had a chuckle to ourselves when Hannah Hampton got signed up by Chelsea because we thought she's just going to be there to warm the bench because there's two great keepers in front of her. How surprised are you that how quickly she's deposed almost these two keepers and settled into Chelsea and just looks part of the furniture there now? She she literally looks like the number one now. Well, it's really interesting because, again, I know people in and around this transfer and I I was really surprised when someone messaged me last summer and said, by the way, this is happening. Um, And when they messaged me, it was like, yeah, okay, you, 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 you will know this is true. Um, so it must be true. But I know for a fact, like Hannah came in and basically at the beginning of the season, she was sat down and said, you know, you might end up being third choice, you might be fourth choice. And she basically told Emma Hayes in no uncertain words, I'm going to make it to a point that, you know, if you have me as third choice, I'm going to show you why I need to be second. And if you have me as second, when I come in and get a game, you're, I'm going to show you why you're not going to drop me and why I'm wow. going to come first choice. And then I'm going to retain the jersey. And she's got so much confidence mm. as a young goalkeeper and as a young player. And I think it took a little bit of time for her to sort of, you know, get to a point where she was ready sort of to get a chance. She played the game against Bristol City right before Christmas. Was brilliant in a game that we didn't actually play very well in, even though we won it 3-0. Um, you know, Bristol were very unlucky not to score that day because we were, quite frankly, pretty awful. And it was more due to individual quality than anything that we didn't concede. And uh, after that, she'd just gone strength to strength to strength. And I think, again, that's a phenomenal thing for England because a few years ago you were sort of having this conversation of, you know, if Erps has a struggles to form, you know, Roebuck obviously isn't playing, who's coming in in it? And now suddenly you've got a situation where you've got Hampton doing really, really well. Obviously, Emily Rams is a really good young goalkeeper, and I think you'll see more of her. You've got Keating at Manchester City. There's so many options all of a sudden in that uh, squad as well. So, yeah, I mean, we're impressed by Hannah Hampton, and I think it's she sort of, um, I thought with Villa, I thought she was going to be at Villa for the long term. Um, so yeah, very surprised that Chelsea picked her up, but she's a quality keeper and, um, yeah, we're pretty all the best and hopefully she can bring that form to England if she gets the chance to, um, no doubting her confidence. What I would like to know uh, from you, Rob, is what's the Chelsea fan or, or, you know, club perspective on Arsenal Jonas at the moment? Because being amongst fans at the Villa game, there is a sort of growing split discourse with Jonas, especially as the season's not maybe gone the way we wanted to. I'm all for Jonas and so are the likes of Matt and Lottie, but I have heard of sort of anti Jonas sentiment growing, questioning him. Well, how do Chelsea view him in the moment? Do they see him as a genuine threat? Um, does Emma Hayes not relish the contest now of Arsenal? Do they see him as a talented manager or do they see him as someone they can easily sweep aside? I mean, I think Emma referenced it the other week. Her and Jonas actually get on extremely well. Um, they're, they're extremely good friends apart from when they're in the technical area. And uh, they, they do get on extremely well. And I do know... For a fact, certainly when, you know, last year when the title was confirmed, one of the first messages Emma got uh, afterwards congratulating her was from Jonas. And I think personally, from my point of view, I think with Jonas, what I do sort of think is that he gets a little bit of, I think, a bad sort of rap because of the fact there's so much expectation historically for Arsenal to be winning everything. And now it it ultimately is a more competitive sort of field. Um, I compare it a little bit to, I think, that you kind of almost don't know what you have until it's gone. Uh, yeah. I think Jonas is very, very good in sort of tactical situations of getting tactics right in big games. But when he doesn't get it right in big games, it's quite stark. And it's yes. quite a big, you know, it, there's quite a certain disparity. That said, what I will give him real credit for is he's one of those managers I could see players would want to go to war for. And I use Emma Hayes as an example for this. Mm. To me, Mark Skinner is a lovely guy. And I think Mark Skinner is actually, you know, gets a lot more flat than he wants. But he's not the sort of manager I'd see players thinking, yes, I want to, you know, I absolutely want to run for a brick wall for you. I want to, you know, throw myself in front of that shot on the last minute and potentially, you know, tear my hamstring in a cup final for you. That sort of manager. Jonas, to me, is that sort of person. And I think you've seen this week with the interview um, Alessia Russo sort of gave. She sort of said about the culture at Arsenal and the, uh, the way the management staff sort of behaved that was different to, uh, you know, it was a lot more sort of focused and a lot more interested in the person rather than sort of the, the product in terms of the footballer. 
So I, I think he's, you know, ultimately Arsenal are a top side and on their day, they can beat anyone in the WSL. On their day, they can be a match winner in Europe. I don't think any Chelsea fan is going to look at it and think, you know, Jonas has done it before, like we saw last year. In, mm. You know, in this exact final, we saw Jonas do a number on us. And quite frankly, so, you know, I'm going to, I think, I'm, yeah. I'm going to move on to that in the middle of the, the previous final. I did want to just touch on, though, some of um, your star players and a few that have caught my eye. Um, firstly, Agabitha Jones. How impressed have you been of her this season? Because, Matt, you got to watch her at Everton last season. How impressed have you been with ABJ um, this season, sort of breaking into the team? I think she scored against West Ham uh, the weekend as well. If I'm correct. She scored quite a few goals. Will she start the final? And how worried should we be of her? I don't know, in all honesty, for the final because Emma, like Emma, does like selection, but she sort of surprises. But she did say, like you know, the forwards have given her a real selection headache after Ajax. Um, Beaver Jones is a great young footballer. I think it's you know it's really special. I said it like from last with Woodman Moy and with Will Williamson. It means something really special when you've got someone who's come through your academy, who's one of your own, who's doing well in the first team. And I think Chelsea are finally starting to really reap that with you know with Beaver Jones. She's had a few years out on loan, learning a trade, and she's come back. I think the year at Everton last year was really formative for her because mm. she got to play, you know, so much regular football. Didn't necessarily score as many as she'd like, but she got so much minutes. And I think you're seeing this with Cool. I think Cool is going to come back an immensely better footballer in the summer from the amount of minutes she's yes. got at Everton in the second mm. half of the season because minutes are so important at that young age. Even when players aren't necessarily winning games or you're necessarily doing as well, it's just getting that time on the pitch to grow. And she's so direct. She's so fast. I think, you know, Beaver Jones is one of those players I think is going to spearhead the attack for Chelsea for... You know, ideally for the next decade. I would be quite happy to have her there for the next decade. Well, one player who definitely is spearheading heading the attack at the moment is, of course, Lauren James. Um, for me, she's one of the most talented wingers forwards in the WSL. And we've seen her twice this season against Arsenal. And they, um, I think it's fair to say she had two very different games. Um, at Stamford Bridge, tore us to pieces. Electric. Stamford Bridge has sort of become her home. Scored hat-tricks against Man United. Liverpool scored against... Us gave Steph Cutler a torrid time, but at the Emirates Stadium, um, she didn't really have much of a sniff. And um, I know there was a lot of uh, sickening abuse. I'm not even going to go there hard away afterwards. Um, but she did obviously have a reckless petulance, or we say, stamp at Leah Valti, who on a different day could have been given a red card, although we know in the WSL, red cards just don't get given out. Why did it go so wrong for Lauren James on that day? But why did it go so right at, St- at Stamford Bridge when um, they took Arsenal to the cleaners? I think, in all honesty, like on that day at the Emirates, I think it's hard to find a player who went right for for a Chelsea perspective. Um, you know, in all honesty, I, I think James is one of those players. She does get frustrated when she's, you know, doesn't feel like she's necessarily getting the decisions or getting the protection she mm. wants from um, referees. And that is, you know, the club are working on her. She's a young player. She's gonna work that out, I think. Um, but ultimately, it does need to. Yeah, you know, it does need to stop because one of these days it's going to get called out and it's going mm. to be a big problem. I think in the game at Stamford Bridge, I think the difference was that she had almost, um, she sort of occupied that free role, not really as a false nine, but as sort of like a nine and a half was the phrase I used, and that she had the ability to go wide and, you know, the ability for Nuskin to sort of push up and be the actual nine so she could just sit off her. And no one could really, I think, get near her. And... I, you know, I wasn't really sure in the first half. It looked like Pullover almost had been tasked with sort of the player-to-player marking role mm. of it, and it just frankly didn't work for a number no. of reasons. Um, and I, I think if you, you know, if Lauren James is given the time and space, she can do damage to you. If you keep tight to her, I think you can limit it. But then it also then you have the element of that, you know, the risk of the jeopardy of do other Chelsea players make more of the other space? Yeah. At the Emirates, they couldn't. Obviously, you know, in a game like Sunday, it might be a different story. I. I... I agree totally. And I think back to the World Cup um, in Australia when we saw the two sides of Lauren James. We saw the Lauren James who tore up the group stage and looked amazing. And then we saw the Lauren James in the last 16 in that game. game she did get you know, called out and that sort of really ended her um, her World Cup quite sadly. Um, I, again, one of the greats. I wish we could have seen Lauren James all the way through because I think she was that much of a talent. She could have really lit up the World Cup in a way I think of the men's side at way like sort of Rooney excited at Euro 2004. It could have been that sparky exciting player but i think she's gonna have a great career at chelsea and i think she's the next tournament the euros which i believe we're in switzerland i think she's gonna have an electric tournament then last this is of course a repeat of last season's conti cup final and it went rather well for arsenal so uh, i'll open this to, to all of you so um matt and lottie 
where do you think it went so right for us um, on the day? I'll start I with you, Matt. Lottie, sorry. 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 No, yeah, go for, go for it. Go for it. I think it was at the point <laughs> when we realised that Emma Hayes had decided she wanted to change all her right backs and she'd mm. made the wrong decision. And I think that gave us confidence because all of a sudden in the first half, we see all these changes happening mm. and we're still zooming down that right flank. And it, it's like sitting in the Arsenal end, it's like, oh, we've actually got a sniff here. Let's let's just go for it. And it it played out well for us. Yeah. For me personally, I think everyone was in top form. Like we, we did have a ACL pandemic, which has kind of moved over to Chelsea now. And mm. I've just, I'm actually surprised we actually won that still because of what was going on within within the club in terms of injuries. What about you, mate? What was your? How did you think we actually nailed this last season? You know what? I was just thinking about it, and I think the fact that we had Manu uh, towards us in the first half, and mm. we that sort of was the because as soon as that uh, Sam Kerr goal goes in in the first minute, I, there's a little bit of a pause that you hear the Chelsea fans a little bit. Um, we can't hear them because they're they're the other side. And, mm. um, but as soon as you hear everyone start singing, singing and getting back involved, I was pretty much back from that kickoff. That's when it all of a sudden came. It became apparent that there was a lot more belief mm. in in the side than they thought. And it, I think that's just come from um, the the way we the fans have been in uh, leading up to that game. Uh, traveling all all sorts of miles. I mean, Adam, you and myself have been have been traveling up and down um, the country for that as well. Bear in mind, we also did Europe as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I it just felt like as soon as that goal went in, it was like, okay, don't panic. Let's try it. We've got a lot of time left. Let's make sure that we can go and do something. And then as soon as that pe- we got the penalty, Kim Little scores. Oddly enough, that's uh, Kim Little was scored in two Conti Cup finals, two mm. uh, ten years apart from each other, the twenty thirteen yes. and the twenty twenty three. And that one a goal against Birmingham was um, quite a special hit. I was yes. trawling through the archives the other day. I, I love the fa- I've looked back at it and I've seen that fa- she scored, but she fell out over afterwards, which makes it even more impressive to actually score. Um, but yeah, I just think the lead up to that helps quite a lot. I, just, I think maybe this season it's not going to be about the belief and all the injuries. It's going to be a talk of it's, it's, you've got players out for both teams at this time. So it's going to be a very 50-50 game. And mm. it's scary to think of at this moment in time. I'll come to you, Rob, to see the other side of the, the fence because it did go Robsy wrong for, for Chelsea. Um where did it, where did it go wrong last season? I mean, my always thought, I echo Lottie's sentiment. I always thought if Emma Hayes is making substitutions before half time, you know you've won the game. Um, was it really as simple as not getting the defence right, or or how did so much of it not go well? I think there was a couple of things. Number one, I think there was an attempt to try and play too much, like we did the previous week in the uh, FA Cup game. Yeah, because we tried to basically do a repeat of that, and I think Arsenal obviously had learned from that. Number two, I think scoring that early kind of surprised us a little bit how easy it was to sort of cut through and score. And I think it led to a edge of, you know, as I said, the dangerous element of complacency coming into it. And when you suddenly, you know, you get complacent, you drop off, it's very, very hard to go again. Mm. Um, And I also do think, you know, as I would say, when you concede right before half time, I think that third goal right before half time and the nature of the third goal Mm. was such a killer blow because at 2 1, Obviously, you're disappointed, but you're getting your players back in. You're saying, you know, one more goal, you'll take it to extra time. At 3-1, you even know, you know, even if you get a goal back, sort of, say, with 10 minutes to go, you've still got to really push and go for it, and you could just easily end up losing 4-2. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, do you think back to what happened last time around with Man City, the fact that Ellen White goes and bundles it over as well? Do you go back to that as well? It's like, not not again sort of thing. Yeah, mm. maybe. I think I think you have an element of that sort of um, sort of mentally. Again, that, that Manchester City one, that that was more of a case that at half time or not, we should have been. You know, that that final should have been dead and buried. Mm. We had the chances to make that dead and buried. And I sort of said to someone at half time, I remember that day at that game at Wimbledon, saying, you know, we won the lot, but we should be you know three and a lot here. This will be the sort of game where 
you know, you should the second goal was what you needed to sort of calm things down and kill things off. Um, I think one of the biggest sort of um, things you saw was the fact that Chelsea used both Ingle and Yelena Shankovic um, last year in that sort of you, Shankovic in that 10 and Ingle in that midfield role. I think that was the first game where you started to see as wonderful footballer that Sophie Ingle is and watch a fantastic ambassador for the game. When she's against pacey, um, you know, pacey midfielders that have, you know, engines on them or alternatively could Fred pass this through, you can really dominate Sophie Ingle nowadays, unfortunately. Mm. And I think this is, you know, it was one of the many games where you see the difference between Melanie Leopold and Sophie Ingle in there because Leopold does everything Ingle can do, but is just that bit quicker and that bit more, you know, energetic. And I sort of said to someone, if only we had Leopold on this day, because I think she was the one who was such an important player in that FA Cup final in 2021. She had such a good game that day in breaking up the Arsenal midfield. And I think you've also got to give Arsenal credit. Like, you know, I'm looking at the sort of the lineups here. You've got Kim Little in there who won her day. You know, if she's on form and on song, yeah. just pass, pass, pass around you and, you know, conduct it around you. You had Blackstania. So I think gets an awful lot of, I think, unwanted, unwarranted criticism at times. I think Blackstain is actually a really good poacher and a really good centre forward. She's just, um, mm. she's not a striker as per se. I think she's a poacher. But I think mm. if you use her right, she's actually really devastating. Um, you know, that defence there, you've got obviously, uh, you know, I think Catley's a very good player, but uh, Rafaela and Leah Williamson at the back, you know, if yeah. they're playing very, very well. We, we miss Hafa every Twitter. day. We miss Hafa every day. She was a, a, a legendary player that we only got a glimpse of. And, and then she was sadly, she was sadly off to America. Um, you did mention the FA Cup, the weird situation with the FA Cup game. And then we had the Conti Cup game last season. We sort of had a repeat at this time around with the game at Stamford Bridge. Uh, Emma Hayes, did us something a bit clever with her forwards. We had a, a Nuskin, I think, as a striker, and then sort of Lauren James sort of floating around. Do you think she'll just go for the same again? You know, if it worked once, it'll work twice, or or do you think it we might actually um we might see Ramirez come back in the front line or she might try and change it again? Uh, honestly, I wouldn't like to predict knowing Emma. It wouldn't shock me if she put Myra Ramirez in because she knows she'll know that Myra can play with her back to goal and she is one of those players that can drop deeper. Um that said, it also wouldn't shock me if she tried to maybe put Myra in sort of off the left, maybe, and maybe play Aggie mm. Beaver-Jones through the middle to have that fluidity in the attack, or even put Lauren James through the middle again and just have a really fluid attack. Um, there's the Cat Macario factor of, the, you know, is this finally the game where Emma decides to give her <laughs> a start? Uh, and I, I, you know, I honestly, I, I've, tr- I've given up trying to predict Emma Hayes' starting lineup. So I remember... Well. <laughs> like you know, trying vividly to do it and just being like, yeah, you know, I've got about six of the players right. So, well, that's too bad, Rob, because that's going to be my next question. Because we, we'll do it for both teams. Don't worry, it's equal treatment. So, if I was to come to you, say, pick a starting eleven. How? Well, not necessarily what Emma Hayes would pick, but if you could pick the starting eleven for the Conti Cup final for Chelsea, who are you going to go for? All right, okay, so I think Hampton in goal. Um, yeah, he said. Uh, Ev Perisse at right back because you know she's found a real vein of form recently. Uh, Carter and Buchanan at centre back because I think they're our only fit central defenders at this moment. <laughs> in time. That makes it nice and easy in this position. Um, left back, uh, left back. I think it will be um, Neem Charles getting the nod. Although if we had had the opportunity, I would have rather played Natalie Bjorn at centre back and put Carter in at left back for the defensive solidity yeah. that I think she offers. Um, in the midfield, it's going to be Cuthbert and Lurpol's uh, sort of sitting. I think I would probably go for Nuskin in that strange number 10 role that she Mm. seems to somehow have become really good in. I've got no idea how she's become so good all of a sudden as a number 10. It makes me look like an idiot because I wrote loads of articles last year on her being a a central defensive midfielder for us. So it makes me look like a real idiot. Hey, Um, we had, we had Yen beat as a striker. So we, we, (laughs) (laughs) we've done the same, you know, we've led the charge on that one. (laughs) 100%. And then uh, Lauren James, I think probably off the right, I think Mm. on the left, I'm going to, I think it will be right, and I think it was what Emma yeah. will go for, but I'd actually like it to be Aggie Beaver-Jones because mm. I'd really like her direct ability to run in behind and run the channels and how hard she works from a defensive point of view as well. And then Myra Ramirez up front because, you know, whatever happens on Sunday, if your you know, strikers get 90 minutes playing it for Myra Ramirez, they're not going to want to do it again in a hurry. Well, she, she's, um, I mean, she had a bit of an injury, but I think we've seen enough of her to see there is a talent there. Um, and I, I think she is definitely one to worry about. And I, Wrighton is, for me, she's one of the most underrated sort of players in the, in that team. The likes of um, Lauren James get a lot of the headlines. And Sam Kerr, when she is fit, gets a lot of headlines. But that Wrighton, you know, 
ignore her at your peril because she will she will turn up and she will chip in with the goals. And I think her being, um, I don't think she was either injured or not fully fit for the Emirates Cup game, Emirates game um, earlier this season. She came off the bench. I think that did play into her hands as well that she wasn't able to. And before we move on, just Frank Kirby sort of fading into the background at Chelsea. Um, just having to, are we going to be seeing much more of her there? She seems to be mix of injured and just not being picked anymore. We've seen the end of what's been a stellar career um, at, at, at Chelsea. Honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I think Chelsea would like to be sent there because she's such a phenomenal footballer. But I also do think Fran wants to play and wants to play regularly. And as I mm. sort of said to someone, you know, you're now looking at a situation where while Kirby has sort of been out, you've had Lauren James appear and be able to play in that number 10 role. You've got Nuskin able to play in that number 10 role and, you know, do it some bizarre effect. You could stick Macario in there, you know, as the number 10 if Sam Kerr is fully fit. You can play Myra Ramirez in there. It's no longer, I think, quite as cut and shut a case. Mm. And that is devastating because I think with Frank Kirby, so much of her time has been robbed due to injury. But that said, she is still the player on the day that if you said to me, you know, go and make magic happen or you wanted someone to bring a yeah. to make magic happen, she'd still be, you know, by far top of my list. Absolutely, absolutely. And I hope, you know, hope, well... I hope we'll see a bit more of her down the end of the season. Um, if she does play in a final, I hope she doesn't have a stellar game because that'll be dangerous for us. And I, I still remember that cup final when she scored after three minutes and her and Sam Kerr just, just tore us to pieces. Um, that thankfully concludes the Chelsea aspect. We can now move on to Arsenal stuff <laughs> and and maybe discuss how Arsenal may line up. Um, so obviously, Belty's out injured. Uh, Amanda is no longer playing the rest of the season. Hertig who knows uh and Veen Reuter this is probably too soon um but it's skins we're in a scary position like we were on Friday where we think oh we actually got quite a lot of players available now this is quite a weird situation and we all remember how that turned out so uh Lottie I'll come to you how do you think Arsenal will respond after Friday's um well last Friday's debacle do you have to remind me? I was in the away end and I had nightmares getting in and yes. out of that place. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Manu Zinsberger, uh, going left to right, Kate McCabe, Lotta, Leah, mm. and in... Well, this is what, this, what the forward line is what I wanted to focus on first, which was okay. Steena and Russo. So it's always been the bit of how we're going to combine our nines, our tens, and is Russo you know a what? nine, I is Russo a ten? Liked... I'd liked it when we had Russo out on the left. So, and I'd put Steena up top and then have Frida in that 10. Because right. I just sometimes feel like Frida really struggles working with Russo when it, she's ahead of her. She's not always quite reading the balls correctly. And it's it, Russo likes to drop a lot deeper than Steena does. Yeah. Steena is that poacher, as Rob said earlier. And that's what Frida looks for mm. when she's we, getting that ball forward. Do we think we have to simply. Jonas should maybe swallow his pride of this one and just stop trying to play Russo as a nine and start playing her as a ten. Yeah. Mm. It's going to happen. She can do it. Mm. We've seen it. Mm. So it's a case of, does he really want to take this chance on this sort of season-defining game? Yes, that's the sort of the question. Because, he, I mean, we, he's been very reluctant to go for the Stina Russo 9-10 partnership. We saw it at Brighton. Um, and we saw it for the last 20 minutes against Aston Villa and watching on from the stands, I thought it looked rather good. Although at the same time, I think Aston Villa's legs are gone um, by that point. Um, Matt, any thoughts on the Steiner and Russo? Should it be one? Should it be both? Should it be, as maybe Lottie suggests, Russo on, on the left? I think Jonas made his mind up and Steiner's going to start up top. I think uh, Alessia's going to be on the bench for this one. Um, ah. And that's only down to the fact that he decided last week that Caitlin was going to be dropped to the bench. Um, we all have different opinions on Caitlin. On <laughs> um, let's just leave it at that. But I think Caitlin comes back in. Beth plays on the right. But if I'm honest, Beth kind of isn't, hasn't really turned up for all um, ga games that she has done in the past. She so... likes to ball against Chelsea. We know this. Yes. That is true. Actually, should actually a good point, Matt. I'll come to you on this one, Rob. Beth Mead, um, what's this sort of sentiment towards her from the Chelsea side? Because she does have an uncanny ability to score against Chelsea um, down the years, <laughs> including a hat trick annoying. for Sunderland. Uh, uh, <laughs> an annoying is the phrase I use about Beth Mead. Um, she's one of those really annoying footballers that, uh, again, it's a phenomenal thing to have on your side, where she can do absolutely nothing for 89 minutes, hmm. and bang, 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 she's banged in a hat trick against you. 
Um, and I think, you know, Lauren James is a similar player in that regard. She can be completely out of it. And then mm. suddenly, you know, she gets the ball. Oh, you know, you know, she's turned three players and, you know, curled it in. And you're sat wondering what was going on for the rest of the game. Um, uh, that said, I do think recently, certainly in the game at Stanford Bridge and also, you know, uh, more recently, Chelsea had more of a shackle on Mead when they've managed to get her going deeper to collect the ball. Because then by that point, you know, you can get away with the fact Aaron Cuthbert will give her a sly, you know, kick in the ankles halfway through the half and go down. And as we all know in the WSL, tactical fouls don't get called up as yellow cards even when they should. Yeah. So your defence midfielder can get away with about seven of them before they finally get the booking that they should have got for one. So Unless uh, yeah, you're Katie uh, McCabe. Or Katie Zeller. Well, yeah, well, Katie's no, the opposite, there, there, are, there are definitely, you know, there are definitely exceptions. But <laughs> I do think that, you know, I, I do certainly think from Mead's sort of point of view, Mead is a, you know, he's a very, very good player. And she's one of those players, again, that, you know, if you're looking at match winners on either side, she's mm. the sort of name that's never going to be far from the list. Um, you were suggesting Lottie having Bruce on the left. Do you think, therefore, will therefore not see Lacasse at all? Do you not... Off, I mean, you know she's great. Obviously. I would, I would just, just to frustrate Chelsea, I'd bring her on as fresh legs in the second half. Okay. Because fresh legs, Beth Mead is much more fun when everyone's starting to get tired. So, so what, I'd actually just... start Chloe on the right. Ah, okay. That's mm. that's interesting. But I never mentioned okay. the right earlier, so no, you didn't. It's just, you didn't. It's just to change it up a bit, but. I'm always wrong. I've predicted Kyra Cooney Cross to start nearly every game this season, and the one time I don't, Matt does, and she starts. So I've given up on predicting teams. <laughs> well, I hope you haven't, because we're going to do that a bit later. Um, I was there for the me and Matt. Well, we and Matt were both there, although Matt sadly had to depart early due to the train times um, at the game at Villa Park. Um, first half, Arsenal were dominant, but not a threat. Second half, we were dominant and very much a threat. Um, Matt, did you think this? Is this the game we finally clicked this season? Because it's been this, it's been very sort of hit and miss. We've had whispers of potential and it come to nothing. But did that second half give us a bit of hope that maybe this is how we could play against Chelsea? Well, Chelsea aren't going to come and play a deep block against us. So I'll probably say no. I think it's more of, OK, we know what to do against the likes of the West Hams. Um, I'll probably say when we play Everton, because uh, although Everton will play a high line, I just don't. Th- I think they will try and do a low block just because mm. they know that it's going to frustrate them. And um, there'll be other teams. Uh, Bristol might do it as well uh, next weekend as well. So no, sorry, not next weekend. The weekend two after. Weeks. Yeah, two weeks. <laughs> I, I I think that was more of it than the case of this is how we're going to play against Chelsea. I think. This was a case of what are we gonna, what are we gonna do for this weekend? Who needs, who needs to? We need to sort of freshen up the attack because Caitlin Ford's been just not. I don't, she hasn't hit the heights of previous seasons. She, let's, let's put it diplomatically. Yeah, around this time, she, she's right. had a bad season. Let's be honest, yeah. she hasn't even scored against Tottenham this year. No, no. This not time, so unlike Caitlin. <laughs> Let's just say around this time she's usually in form, like she she'd be scoring every that 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 every single game pretty much, and she just hasn't. So um, you can call it fatigue from World Cup, fatigue from travelling, fatigue for whatever reason. The fact Matt, that she has Matt, been basically. How many minutes has she, has she played? She's about, played about two thousand and two hundred minutes this season. One thousand two hundred and ten, I think it was. I think Steph Catley's got them got one the most. No, before. it was one thousand one hundred and fifty-five. Yeah, minutes sorry, I'm Steph. thinking of Steph. And Steph. then um, I think it was Caitlin was a little bit more. She was the top. Yeah. Top of the list, more or less. Fifty one thousand five hundred, I think it was. Then. But it's it's a ridiculous number. It's been a ridiculous number of minutes by by all of them. I think we can agree. They, I think maybe we are seeing the the effects of that now. Um, as for the defence, Leah didn't have a great game against um, uh, Chelsea. Are you confident that maybe she will uh, get it right this time around? Yes. Yeah, Lottie. Um. I'm not sure. I don't like I don't like doing this stuff. Um yeah, you're gonna have to come back to me on that one, Adam. <laughs> okay, well we'll go straight in then to our Arsenal predicted lineups then. Um there's a lot to choose from, plenty of options. So uh Matt, I'll come to you first. How would you line Arsenal up on Sunday? It's an odd one because every time I say in the Conti Cup it's gonna be Sabrina. Um 
if she had uh, she didn't play against Villa in that semi final. No. Um. So I will probably imagine Man who's going to be in goal for this one. Uh, centre back pairing picks itself at the moment. Lotta and Leah on the right. Emily Fox, which is what should have happened against Chelsea to begin mm. with. Left back. Oh, uh, oh, that's hard. Do you go Katie left back or, or Steph, and then? No, I'm going to push Katie further up. So I think it's going to be Steph to start. Mm. I know I did say that Caitlin was going to be le- playing on the left um, to start with, but um, that piv- a double pivot. We I think we know Kim's definitely one of them. Um, I th- uh, yeah, I think it's going to be uh, Vic alongside her, and then uh, Leonard's and Marnham playing as the attacking midfielder. Mm. Or then again, it might be Linhard and Marnham, and then Kim Little playing as an attacking midfielder. On the left, I'll go Katie McCabe, even though I did say Katie McFord mm-hmm. a little bit earlier. Uh, up front, Steena, and then on the right, Chloe, which was what I was trying to say before uh, yeah. someone got there before. Me. <laughs> well, no, Lottie, sorry, you, not you've, sorry. you've played half your cards already, but let, let's see how how was it you're going to line up the eleven. My, the thing there. is, my lineup is very similar to Matt, except I'd have Katie down the left at the left back. Right. And the rest would all be pretty standard. Vic, Vic and Kim in the middle, Frieda at ten. And as I said earlier, Russo on the left, Dina up top, and Chloe on the right. I personally would go, I think Manu is guaranteed to be in goal. I can't swear seeing. I can think Lotta and Leia. I mean, shout out to Lotta. I think, she, again, I think she's having an amazing season. And I think it's kind of weird having a defensive partnership where you could argue that Lotta is having is playing better than Leia. We normally that to be the other way yeah, around. It's but, kind of a bit rolls of earth, which is quite weird. For that, for that, for that debate, I think that will come to a head next season because we yeah. know she's not fully fit. That's so exactly. as much as Lot has been player of the season for me, mm. yeah, that debate's for next season. I, I would definitely play Fox at the right back. Um, again, she's been electric. We've only seen a few whispers of her, and then she was whisked away from us. It's great to have her back, and I thought she was really good against Aston Villa. Um, for me, it's Katie McKay at left back. Um, I think Catley and Ford worked well off the bench at the weekend, and I, th- I would like to keep it that way. So I would have, I'll personally be with Kim and Pelot. This is the problem with no Leah Velti because you sort of, you're slightly leaving the back door open. You're not having that defensive linchpin that Velti offers, and we're going to have to sort of work a way around that. I think, I don't think Kara Cooney Cross is ready yet to be that Leah Velti midfielder um, that maybe we wanted to be. So it will have to be in my eyes. Kim and Vic Pelova. And then attack, I would have Mead on the right, Lacasse on the left, Russo 10, Steena 9. And I would go with that as my front four. And then you could have the option of maybe bringing Ford off the bench uh, or Catley off the bench like we did um, against Aston Villa. Um, this is a question for all of you, really. Um, but we'll all obviously say, yes, our team needs it more. But this team, this trophy needs means different things for different teams for Arsenal this is basically this will save our season effectively I think whereas for Chelsea this is the start of what could be a potential quadruple um something they've never managed before um Rob where do you see this in your potential trophy hall this season is this the least important one or do you see this as the building block to what could be a spectacular finale for Emma Hayes I, I don't like using the phrase least important but I think it is you know being completely honest I think if you ask me which one, you know, if you said you can win three of the trophies, this would be the one that comes bottom of the sort of list, just due to the fact that I love the FA Cup, the WSL is the WSL and the Champions League. You know, I don't think any of us would argue that would be top of the list. Um, but I think it's I think it's really important for both sides. Like ultimately, one, we're rivals. Both of us will, you know, want the bragging rights at the end of the day. Regardless, we've both suffered, you know, drubbings at each other's homes this season which you know we're both equally frustrated about this is the chance of one of us finally to properly you know get the uh, sort of chance to actually say you know put a card down I think for Arsenal it's possibly slightly more important because obviously if you don't win it I think there's a chance maybe your season sort of peters out completely and it's then hard you know how much motivation can you retain seeing as that you're going you know let's face it you're going to finish third I'm going to come out so. and say, <laughs> I'll go out on a limb and say, you're going to finish third. I don't think you're going to overtake City. I, I don't think you're in the title race um, as per se. But that said, if you do win this weekend, it's the sort of thing that can give you the shot on the arm. And the fact you've still got to play City, you know, there is still jeopardy in there. It's not a huge gap we're sort of talking about at this moment in time. And I still do think, you know, both Chelsea and City will drop points 
somewhere in the run. And I've said this to a few people. Um, I still think both of them will drop points because it's a more competitive WSL. Uh, from a Chelsea stage, I think, yeah, you're, you're talking about is the building block sort of for it. But also, historically, after the contract, that sort of marks the beginning of our run-in. And there's a special thing about run-in Chelsea. Run-in Chelsea just know how to get the job mm. done. Um, mm. Sometimes it's spectacular and brilliant. And, you know, we'll do things like thrash Leicester and then thrash Everton and then, you know, thrash West Ham. Or alternatively, we'll just go and grind out three awful one nils in a row. And, you know, oh. get get nine points on the board and, you know, then points are the points. So I think it's big for both teams. Actually, can just we want to, uh, and Lottie, to say on the title race, because we, mm. I remember two seasons ago when Chelsea won 4 2 against May United final day, curb, you know, late, yeah, lob over Mary Earps, which just broke all our hearts. This season, you're level pegging with Man City on points. Obviously, you've got the better goal difference. Obviously, you're a Chelsea fan, you're going to see you want Chelsea to win. But honestly, with the way the teams are playing at the moment, who do you think is going to win the league? Honestly, I've tossed up on this like multiple times. And again, I've, I've, you know, I've debated on multiple things. I think at this moment in time, it's impossible to call on both of them. Because I think both Chelsea and City will drop points somewhere. Um, I think both of them have shown the ability to be you know, very, very good, but also shown the ability to grind out results. I do think the fact that Chelsea have the history of doing it, like mentally give them a little mm. bit of the edge. And also the fact Chelsea have shown that through injuries this season, they can make things work and adapt and men. Whereas City haven't really had situations where I've say, Bunny Shaw's been injured or mm. Yui Hasegawa has been out. Um, so I think, uh, uh, in all honesty, it's too close to call. I, I, I really want it to go down to the final day because mm. it's probably going to be the only European league that does that. You know, Bayern are going to, walk away with Frauen Bundesliga, Barcelona, you know, may as well already be champions in Spain. We may as well have given that to them after about week two. Um, in Italy, Roma have got, you know, I think a, a seismic gap on Juventus, which is why Joe Montemuro ended up leading, saying Arriva Dirty to them. Um, and in, you know, uh, in France, it, you know, let's be honest, it's Leon. <laughs> it's I Leon mean, and the rest. How, how just a quick... Oh, we've, oh. Get the Arsenal side of this, but how quick, how good would it be from a Chelsea perspective to see Emma Hayes lifting the WSL at Old Trafford in front of in, in a stadium that has that much notoriety and legacy? I'd love that. The the thing I'd actually love slightly more is if we could lift it the midweek beforehand against Tottenham. A because it I really don't like Tottenham, too, but then also yes. we'd get Lauren. <laughs> also, then we'd get Lauren Jones getting a guard of honour at Old Trafford. <laughs> um, that would just be something quite beautiful. Indeed, it would. Um, Lot Matt and Lottie, um, if we lose this final, is the season a failure? And if we win it, does it salvage the season or any credibility in your eyes? Let Lottie go first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Well, Nicely. No. Okay. Nicely. Okay. Go on, go. Uh, she's like, sorry. It's like for those audio listeners, she's shaking her head as if to say no. Don't want to go <laughs> first. Um, I think that it's going to be. We're going to have to because, in some ways, um, it's never going to be enough. Whatever he does, whatever he says, is never going to be good enough. It, at the end of the day, results are the talking point. If if I'm honest, I didn't expect, if we're talking about like the title race and everything like that, if you were to say whether it's open or closed shut for Arsenal, it's a different debate. I think we've all said it's pretty much over and done with. Um, but I don't see City this season as as much of a threat. I thought they were more of a threat last season with the fact that Bunny Shaw was scoring so many goals. Mm. And then you had Chloe and, and Hemp, uh, Chloe Kelly and Hemp help, uh, helping adding into that as well with... Um, but nothing really has changed from City this season. They've just managed to get a lot more points than they did lot. I know it sounds really uh, dumb, dumb to say, but they've managed to get points where they they needed to, a, a bar when they've come to our so, so far. Mm. And uh, they Brighton. Got, yeah. So it's just one of those ones where, where City have just found themselves in a better position. I don't think they are title challengers. Well, um, going to be title challengers. Is, I would have thought they would have been title challengers next season with what's going on potentially um, around them. Uh, what was what, well around WSL? We've got a, there's going to be so many manager changes left, right, and centre. I imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us this season, I think it's important to get that trophy. It's been a while since the Conti Cup has 
hasn't um, been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Retained. Retained for a while. Thank you. Uh, mm. Retained for a while. I think I can't remember the last team to do it. It was uh, Chelsea against Bristol City when they no, uh, won, won mm. six nil, and yeah, hasn't been done since. So it it's been a bit of a while. Um, so it would be great to do it, but this game, I think, if I'm honest, if I was to point out one team, it would be I. Th- I think Chelsea of like the favourites, but I th- I think it's going to be Chelsea. They're going to win it this time around. Well, we'll get to the score predictions in a bit. Lottie, oh, for, same question really. If if we lose this one, how damaging is it going to be for season and and potentially maybe even for Jonas? Well, we we've already seen the cracks. Yeah. Um, we've had conversations amongst ourselves about this and. It is not going to be good enough, but it's a question of what do you, where do you go from there? Yeah, Matt's just mentioned there's going to be loads, loads of loads of management movements. Would you rather not have a manager where you know what you're getting and you know what he has planned, or mm. do you welcome in the devil that is behind him? So there's going to be a lot of movement over the summer, and I'd, I'm probably going to get crucified in the comments of of this, but I'd rather keep hold of Jonas for another season. Same. Same. And, and then just see what see what happens because the league is going to be extremely different next year with no Emma Hayes, mm. and it's I feel like whoever comes into Chelsea, they're going to walk into a free for all because the league is completely changed because there won't yeah. be that dominant force of Emma Hayes. No, I, I think there's, there's going to be a power vacuum amongst the teams, yeah. and it's going to be there is an there is an opportunity there to cement your status, and if you don't take it next season. There's a chance you may never will because you know when Emma Hayes sees control, that door closed, and you've got to make sure you're the first one to you know on that musical chair, if you will, uh, when the when the music stops. We will move on to the dreaded score predictions um, <laughs> and watch us get this hopelessly wrong. Um, Matt, you've I've, I've predicted a Chelsea win, um, so you, how do you reckon Chelsea going to win it? I think I know it's good. I chose uh, Lossie's already going to bang her head against the wall. Uh, <laughs> me saying this, I think it's going to go extra time and and Chelsea are going to win it in extra time 2 1. So, not even penalties. We're not even going to penalty. We should say Arsenal have had a penalty shootout final in the Conte Cup before, uh, but didn't win. Uh, that was against Man City, uh, but they did win the league that season. So, you know, small conservation at the end, I suppose. Um, whilst I think Lottie needs a bit more time on that one. So, Rob, I'm going to come to you. Which way do you see this going and what would your score prediction be? Uh, I think it's going to be, I'm going to go for an absolute goal fest. I think it's going to be 3-3, three, 3-3 three, full time and then 5-4 win in extra time to Chelsea. I just wow. think that I really want both teams just to go absolutely nuts. And I think they've got the capability <laughs> to do that. That that would be that would be something, and that will be a Conte Cup final for the ages. And it, I think it, if you were to get to like a five four state, I think it gets to the point where like you you can't even be mad, you know, when it's been that when there's been so much carnage on the game. I just hope there isn't something something stupid doesn't happen. And I I look back to last weekend and the refereeing decisions that happened, and we got very lucky for a goal. Um, Chelsea got a bit lucky with the West Ham offside goal that obviously wasn't offside and. Man City had a goal that got um, allowed that was also offside. There was a lot of very funny decisions. And I always say these things, you can, it's very easy to to look at it one way, but often your own team does benefit as well when you have grievances. And it's sometimes it's, it's very difficult to um, to distinguish between that. Lottie, have you got a score for me yet? I'm sticking with my same old 3-2 to the Arsenal. Okay. Purely because it's a safe bet and purely because I do want to watch the men's game post the Conti Cup final. And it seems that like Rob and Matt don't want me to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, I, I, there's also I another, t- the second biggest game of the season coming up for the men. I, I, but yeah. I'm going to stick to my same old 3 2. Christina Black sending us to get that winning goal. Well, I, I must admit, I, this Conti, the one thing this Conti Cup final is, is, as much as me trying to forget about it, by thinking about it, I've been forgetting about the Arsenal-Man City men's game, which, well, Man City-Arsenal men's game, should I say, really trying to forget about that that's on the horizon. And I've got, whatever happens, I've got to try and the find a way to watch that. The other one starts. So yeah, exactly. That's if we don't go to AET and penalties. Otherwise, we're not oh. going to see it. 
I, I'm going to be an absolute um, shameless coward. Um, and I'm just going to say 3-0 Chelsea. Um, and that way I'm playing my bets because if, if, if that happens, I'm correct. And if I'm wrong, we've won a trophy. So I'm betting against my own horse and then I'm a winner either right. way. You've realised <laughs> I'm hosting on Tuesday, right? You're going to get roasted. I'm telling you this now. Pair well, with you. I I'm so I disappointed in both of you right now. I think, I think so I disappointed. I'm trying to be more realistic about it. I generally think that this time around it's going to be a bit different. We should also mention as well that this is the first cup final that's going to have VAR. Uh, in oh, the great. <laughs> great. 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 I've got. <laughs> Stina, <laughs> stay on side. Yeah, please stay on side, Stina. You. I, I still remember that Wolfsburg game when we should we should have taken the lead, but we didn't get our players on side enough and, and that goal got chalked off. But no, I, I've done it. But I think I did it before with an Arsenal game and I think we ended up um, winning. So I'm hoping it's, it's, it's a lucky charm. Um, but that's it. That's the end of the preview. Um, my thanks goes out to obviously my co-conspirators, Matt and Lottie, and of course, uh, Rob for guesting in and giving us um, a much needed insight on Chelsea. I think we can see we've got a real game on our hands. Um, so all that's left for me to say is firstly, um, where can we find you all in the scary world of social media? Matt, I'll come to you first. You can find me at MattLR28, or you can also follow the pod at VAWPod. Yes, please do give our Twitter account a follow if you want to uh, keep track of the latest updates, and also give us a, a like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, and give us a follow on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And if you could uh, leave a review or a message of how wonderful or how terrible you think this pod has been, um, we do appreciate it. So do let us know. Uh, Rob, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at, at journalism underscore RP, but more interestingly, you can follow at the zone W football and actually get not only my content, but content from much more smart people than I am. So, you know, <laughs> go do that instead. Absolutely. Do give it a follow. There's some lots of good content on there. Lottie, where can we find you? You can find me in the wonderful world of social media um, at Lottie underscore AWFC. And you can find me tweeting my usual nonsense and attempt to wind up rival fan bases without much success at Adam Salter 4. But that's it. That's the end of the preview. I think um, it's going to be an amazing day uh, at the Molyneux at Wolverhampton Wanderers Ground. Um, a cracking final. Hopefully lots of drum, lots of goals. And um, certainly from my perspective, I hope the red of the Arsenal do shine through. But Above all else, let's hope for a good, clean, thrilling game and may the best team win. Um, come on, you Gunners. Mm-hmm.